Hi everybody, uh, it's Tony Jolly. I'm your English teacher, professional English teacher for your first and second semester of M1. Um, you are archivistique students or you are museum students and we have both of you together because in fact <clears throat> you and I have something in common. You're not going to like what I'm about to say next, but still. Uh, what it is that we have in common is the fact that for all of our lives, we're all going to be in some way, shape or form teaching because everything behind our respective pro professions is to do with learning, helping people to learn and to enjoy learning about something that has value. So I'll talk about that. A little bit later in another video but uh, for the moment I need to tell you a little bit about the course that we're going to be doing and how we're going to be doing it. I've already told you in the video before this one that La Rentrée 2020 is a little bit different for, for me and for us. For health reasons I cannot actually be with you in the classroom for the moment and I'm not, I have to say, too convinced that you will all uh, be able to be there for much longer the way COVID is actually panning out uh, with the numbers rising currently. Either way, um, I have a fair amount of experience with asynchronous learning and teaching and with what we call in English blended learning, the mix of the présentiel, as you would say, and the distanciel. So hopefully through my website, videos like this, which I have hosted on YouTube, we should be able to get along fine anyway. So here we go. So what are we going to be doing together? Well, the first thing is you perhaps need a little, little bit of background about me. My background in the UK, I'm a native English speaker, although my wife would dispute that as I happen to come from Manchester, uh, which is a planet apart uh, in, in her view. But I spent most of my early career as uh, research and development manager for the Southern Tourist Board, an organisation controlling and managing tourism in the whole of the south of England. Not London, but pretty much most of the rest. So we were ideally placed between government, uh, the government tourism bodies, uh, cultural bodies, the, the, the ministries, the ministers, etc. And then at regional level, yes, and then at local level also. And we worked in the public sector, the private sector and the voluntary sector, in other words, associations, etc. So the result of that is that I actually have quite a lot of experience of people who want experiences, whether it happens to be a theme park, that's one type of experience, or a visit to a museum or an archive centre, which is a different sort of experience. But nevertheless, it is an experience that is potential. The problem is, will the museum offer a good experience? It may offer paintings on a wall, but that's not the experience that the customer, the client, the visitor actually has, because the visitor makes his or her experience. So I have a fair amount of knowledge of the background to that, and how tourist attractions, cultural centres, museums, etc., how they work, how they function, and the relationship between their customers and the content of exhibitions, shows, uh, archives, etc., etc. So, with any luck, between the fact that I am English and I've had that experience, and I've been teaching this course here for, I guess, 10 years now, um, we should get along very well. I'm actually based here, I should say. I live in Brunstadt, just outside Malouze, and I teach mostly at the Fondry, uh, IUT in Malouze, and also at the Ilberg campus at the Fac de Lettres. Although at the moment, as I said, I'm very much based at home, dealing with things at distance. I'm going to give you a separate video on how I look at English and English learning, because what I'm going to say to you is a little bit different. and I don't want to make one gigantic long video. So bear with me. 
I'll finish this and then I will go on to that. And I hope you will find that what I'm saying to you is encouraging, supportive, and gives you the opportunity to want to launch out and try. But I'll explain that in the next video. So for this one, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the contexts of what we're going to be doing. I'm going to try and put you in situations, in contexts, in which you are likely to be working so that you can see yourself using your English in a way that you could, well, imagine. I take the view if I can give you something that I know to be real, you're more likely to invest your time, your effort and your motivation in it. So hopefully you're going to find these things I'm about to say interesting. Well, the first thing I'm going to do is to give you a task which is about producing a personal professional profile. No, that's not a CV resume. No, it's not a letter de motivation covering letter. Imagine that you're there on your first day at your, in your dream job and around the coffee machine, the boss who interviewed you and recruited you comes up to you and says, hey, can you do me a favour? And what I'd love to do is to put out a profile on you, who you are, what you're interested in, what your specialities are, etc., etc. I don't want to be, to be as boring or historical as a CV or a covering letter. I need this to be something that will engage with our employees, your colleagues, and with our customers and our clients. So it's going to go in the company magazine, it's going to go on the company intranet inside the company, and it's going to go on the company's website. So I really need a very interesting document about you. And I want you to produce it perfectly in perfect English for our global market. I want you to make sure you've checked it. And I promise you, no one's going to edit this. This is you, the world expert on you. And I'm going to ask you to produce this and I'm going to put it straight on to the corporation's website. So that's going to be your first task. Why? because you're probably going to have to do it for real almost the moment that you're recruited. Secondly, I need to find out something about you. I'd like to know something about who you are, the type of person you are, a little bit about your background, but also you're going to be doing it in English. So I should get to know how you write English. And I'm also going to ask you to do a short video or audio reading some of your profile. So I get to know you a little bit better. I get to hear your pronunciation of English and then I can help you with that. So there's your first task. The second one um, comes if effectively in two parts. I'm going to ask you to look at archives and museums. Define it. What, what do you think it is? What do you think they are? So if you're in archives, I'll be wanting you to think about what archives are, what sort of person could be a good archive specialist? What sort of image does archives have? Is it the same as the reality of what archives really are? Same goes for museums. Are they just places where thousands of years old stuff is stuck for people to come along and look at and think about if they want to. What? Why do we protect and conserve these things to both groups? What is the point? What is their value? What do we ex expect people to learn as a result of it? Why do we protect these things and spend money on them, protecting them? And there's no point in protecting them unless they serve a purpose, unless they achieve something. Now, what is it that we're trying to achieve? So I'm going to ask you to investigate that. Then I'm also in the second part of this, going to get you to think about three key terms that you will come across again and again and again in both of your metier. Heritage, preservation, conservation. What do they mean? Where is the line between them? If I say to you the word preservation, 
Are you understanding what I think of as being conservation? So I'm going to ask you to come up with your own ideas, your own personal ideas. I'm going to ask you to think about the who, the what, the when, the where, the why and the how of each one of those to come up with what you believe yourself and then in a small team you can share that information. I'm going to ask you then after you've produced your own definition to go out and compare and contrast it with other official definitions which are available online. Do we all see those things in the same way? Because unless we understand the terms we're using, unless we share a common vision of them, we're lost. We can't talk. We'll always be talking at cross purposes. So that's going to be our second project. Our third one is going to be about websites. A lot of work is being done by archive centres and museums to give them a role, a presence, an accessibility, an experience, to offer an experience online. Ever much more important perhaps now where it's difficult to visit some of them because of Covid restraint. I'm going to ask you to look at things like language. How many languages do major museums uh, use on their websites? What sort of provision do they make for people of different ages? A child of eight doesn't have the same attention span or ability to use language as you do, as a master's student. What about schools? Do museums and archive centres offer something to them? What about the handicapped? I don't like that word. Pe people who need extra help. People, as we say in English, who have special needs. How well does it seem that these museums provide for people who have those special needs? So I'm going to set you up as consultants to look at three or four of the greatest museums that we have in the UK based in London. And when Covid clears, I hope you'll be interested enough perhaps even to go and visit them. Oh, and entrance is free to three out of four of them. So after that, after you've played the role of consultant and written to the directors of these institutions, offering them analysis and recommendations, we're going to move on. That's websites, particularly for museums. We're going to move on to archives. And I'm going to get you to look at archives in the US and in the UK. Very particular archives. And I'm going to set you almost a, a task, a detective task, to try and find out the real origins of certain things that we take for granted. So I'm going to ask you about those things and set you off with a fairly free choice to be able to look at them. Some of this work is going to be individual. Some of it is going to be in teams. Some of it is going to be written. Some of it is going to be presented. Some of it is going to be in discussion. I'm going to try and put you in situations where you use all sorts of English in all sorts of situations. Then the M word, money. Today, so much costs. And when there are so many essentials like the need for health services and supplies that we're learning about at the moment, can we begin to imagine that the government will open the doors to the coffers of the Treasury to give money to museums and archive centres? Possibly not. Which maybe means that in the future, such institutions are going to have to generate more of their own income and expect less potential income from the state. Well, I have to tell you, this is where dealing with the English speaking world is going to help you. We're much more commercial. And if you look at museums in the UK and the US and compare them to France, 
you will be amazed at the way those institutions have conceived of the idea of making money with which they can employ people, with which they can extend their facilities, build new galleries, offer new services, redo their website. So I'm hoping that we've got something here that we have an exchange on that perhaps you in a French situation may be able to learn from what has already been happening and have a list of ideas that when the time comes you can use in a French context. We may also be talking about getting jobs on the international market where you are probably going to be applying in English. It's not just applying for a job in English, by the way. Um, if you hope to be an academic, if you hope to be a researcher, a specialist, you're going to want to publish. And if you want to get to the journals which are most read and the highest recognised ones, they're almost, I'm not saying exclusively in English, but the widest read ones, the most recognised ones, do tend to be in English. So I'm going to put you through a situation of applying for things like jobs and how to do that in English. And it's not like a one page CV and a 30 minute interview. Trust me, that's dead. Not just in the English speaking market, but when you come out of university with your masters, the world has changed between you starting doing your degree and you finishing your master's. And I need to help you to understand that a lot of the things that you have understood before will no longer work in the recruitment market. And I'm going to do that by helping you to understand how businesses are now looking at recruitment, finding people, selection, selecting people, and retention, keeping the good people and getting rid of the bad ones if you can. Anyway, there's going to be more to it that will come into um, semester two. Certainly one of the things is likely to be uh, culture and COVID. How this has shaken up the cultural marketplace, the idea of visiting institutions physically. What has this done? What do we learn from this discontinuity, this not normal thing that we can use in our future careers? So that's an idea of the things we're going to be doing. I'm using those as an excuse to get you interested to use your English in all sorts of different ways. You may be recording audio files, you may be making videos, um, you may be holding discussions, you may be writing reports, it might be a journal article. There are all sorts of things that we're going to be doing together. This first term, this first semester, however, for the moment, it looks very much like it's going to continue uh, with me at distance. But I am hoping if there is no big second wave that on the other side of Christmas, we might actually get to meet in the présentiel in the classroom and we can get to know each other a little bit better uh, because I would love to be there. I enjoy teaching, I enjoy your presence and it's a little restrictive being at distance even though you're seeing me. It's not quite the same now is it? But let's hope that uh, if we can get Covid out of the picture uh, normal service can be resumed and we can have a little bit more fun and a lot less technology. OK, well, there we go. And now I'm going to do the other video that I promised you, which is about the principles of learning English as I see them. And I think you're going to like it because I'm going to take the pressure right off you. OK, there we go. Thank you very much indeed. Goodbye for now.